Live, great. Yeah, nice to meet you, Atlas. Yeah, I've you been too. chatting for quite some time and look, have been looking forward to this. Me too, um, bro. So Me great too. to get into like the topic of microdosing and what it can do for us in this uh, global awakening. Yes. And yeah, I contacted you or um, suggested this topic because of um, my intuition is that it is more accessible to people that have not yet had like a full on awakening experience with enthusiasm. And so my first question to you would be like, what has your experience been so far with like the different dosages or with the, uh, from ranging from like a true microdose to like a real full on entheogenic release experience? Yeah, dope. Yeah, I love your channel, Conscious Development. It's great, bro. The, for the, all for those that are watching that haven't checked it out, you can find the link in the bio. It's great. He just had Frank Yang on. It was such a good conversation between you guys. I loved it. Yes. It was it's a great so, conversation. So good. Yeah. And I'm glad that we got linked up for this. And I totally agree with what you just suggested, which is that entheogens, especially microdosing, are in many ways exactly what is the tool that we can use to decrease the separation conditioning that has been accumulated over time. Um, so in the dance of the one, which is what this reality is, that when we accumulate separation conditioning, it can be really hard to unwind and soften ourselves back into awakening or into remembering that this is the one dancing with itself and that you are that, you are the entirety of it. Um, and so it's how does one do self-inquiry or um, types of meditations, concentrations and meditations in order to unwind said separation conditioning? Um, much more difficult in many ways than it is to just ingest a single gram of magic mushrooms. And then to, and then to have that experience, which is um, in many ways just a decentralization um, of one's identity into what is the field? That's it. I mean, really, in essence, like you created a um, a boundary, and um, then you turned it into like a self. For many of us, including myself, in this process, we turned it in, this boundary. We turned it into a self-referential system over and over again, which is I am a separate person amongst other separate people, and that everything becomes about that self-referential process. Um, typically things like uh, I need to seek happiness and peace and I'm going to do that by accumulating external things like experiences or relationships or material possessions, substances, this type of stuff. And so then, and that's all to try and heal that illusion of separation conditioning. Um, nothing is ever separate and it's never been separate and everybody is already awake and everybody is already the one. And yet there's the appearance of people being asleep, which are people that have forgotten themselves at the, as the one with the separation conditioning. So for me, the process of just ingesting a single gram of magic mushrooms, which I think is the most simple microdosing um, entry point. Um, so like a single half gram or a single gram of magic mushrooms. Um, and it depends on many other things like the strain. It depends on the concentration of psilocybin and psilocin, the psychoactive compounds that are within it. Um, but in generality speaking, um, that's what I would recommend. And it's just a universalization or a decentralization of your identity. So rather than that egoic self-referential separation process, you become the all. You mm -hmm. recognize the all. So you relax much of the constrained neural circuitry around your identity and you liberate yourself into, oh, I am everything. That is what I am. And I'm infinite. And that's what this shows me. So that would be yeah. my, my answer there. That's so great. Um, that actually kind of refers to my own entrance into like psychedelic experiences. For myself, it um, it was like nine years ago 
that I had like the first magic mushroom experiences. And it started, like you said, like I, I was very naive at that point, I have to say as well. I didn't know much about spirituality, about what this deeper understanding of the world actually can evolve into or how it can change how you perceive this very moment. And so I started also kind of um, from the perspective of a full and theogenic experience, I started kind of low with this like half a gram or a gram experience. But then after two or three experiences of that, I quickly increased to like two and then three grams. And just to give maybe people who haven't had this kind of experience um, a perspective of what to expect. Um, I would share my own experiences with these different levels um, because when you don't have the spiritual knowledge, the background, and you don't know what to look for, in my experience, it was not possible to like dissolve this whole ego structure with the first trips on the microdoses or on the like let's say um, minor doses it's not a, like a true microdose would be like in my understanding something you can function on during your day like maybe 0.1 or 0.2 grams where um, you just do your normal regular stuff but with like half a gram or a gram the first trips they were just colorful nice experiences for me but then after I had like the big awakenings in trips, now the same dose of half a gram or a gram is a completely different story. <laughs> I don't know. How is your experience with like dosages depending on what your level of insight was when you think, think back now? Uh, has it also changed your sensitivity to the substance? Yeah, that's a great insight. So basically, if you take like a visualization where you have like 100% of your separation conditioning that is in store and in place up here, and then you can say that that's like being asleep and that over time, the awakening is just the eradication of the separation conditioning down to 0%. Um, that entheogens, the way that you could see the way that they play is that if you take like a half gram or a gram, let's say to start at a hundred percent, um, you might get exposed to very like clear insight to the interconnectedness of everything. And then you might start questioning your identity being separate. And so that shifted you from a hundred percent separation conditioning, maybe down to like 95% or 90% separation conditioning. And then over time, like you suggested also, you might increase your dosage, maybe to two grams or three grams of a magic mushroom experience. You might also play a little bit with 5-MeO-DMT or LSD. There's plenty of other substances that are psychoactive that are entheogenic to try. And just quickly would like to say entheogen means unleashing God within or unleashing the divine from within. Um, so we're not talking about some sort of a mystical experience that one attains, but we're talking about you recognizing yourself as God, as the one, as infinity, and as all of this being that, dancing. And so bringing it down over time with these higher doses, what happens is maybe you're at like 75% separation conditioning and you take a larger dose. Well, first of all, you're going to have, like you said, all of that insight that has already con pounded since you brought it down from 100% to 75%. And then you're also going to have the larger dose. And the larger dose is going to show you more, um, more of the dissolution of the ego structure, like you were also mentioning. And so um, this is why they're very powerful things. And this is why um, whatever the 1960s or so counterculture, um, this is why that happened as well. Um, very powerful movement, but then also the powerful pendulum swing back with the war on drugs, um, because you can't just dissolve people's ego structures because then there's not going to be consumerist um, and um, people that are uh, working at uh, corporations um, 
as um, asleepingly as the economic machinery and those that are in power um, would enjoy. Um, so yeah, so this is sort of, you could say like the generality of it is the slow unwinding and softening of the separation conditioning from 100% to zero. And um, the way entheogens can play into that, they're very much like um, gateways or like um, they're, they're good parts to the to the journey of awakening, I would say. Mm. Yeah, that mirrors my uh, experience. Um, you mentioned there in the beginning um, that we can also later talk about, I think, is um, that there are other substances like LSD, 5-MeO, DMT. And in my own experience lately, I've also tried 2CB. Um, so let's keep that in the back of our minds because I want would yeah. like to come back to like the differences between psychedelics later um, because I find it it's also something not to overlook um, because it for me it's the flavor of how the experience unfolds nice um, okay then now we have like um, your model of like let's say you, you we all when we get to this let's say we start at our own hundred percent Ego not identification. Everybody. Also important to just say that not everybody, because given if you're birthed to like very awakened parents um, or if you're birthed into um, like a indigenous tribe that is very interconnected with life, um, the uh, the separation conditioning, it may not even start at 100 percent. It might not even form. In the first yeah. place, because you have to you have to re remember that when you're birthed to asleep parents and a sleep culture, then it goes from zero percent and it goes to a hundred percent when you're like yeah. whatever eighteen or twenty five, and then you go and from your twenty five until you're thirty and you're seeking or whatever to decrease it back to zero. So yeah, that's one way to look at it. Okay, so some people will struggle more with this than others. Okay. And also culturally, there are differences. Like I think back or when I think of India, I would imagine there are more people who have like, who are not at 100% ego structure. Oh, nice. Oh, cool. So you might say like, generally, um, per person in the US, there might be more ego structure than per person in India. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I would I would guess like um, because it also shows in our like cultural behavior, like how much we are focused on what we think is real. Like in the mm -hmm. U.S., in the Western world, it's our perception that objects have their own inherent reality that manifests in our behavior of putting so much energy into building all of that stuff and accumulating it in our lives because it gives us this feeling of having something real in our life because we have confused that to be the case. Um, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of assumptions that are tied into the self-referential ego structure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because you mentioned it in the beginning. It's basically this um, self-referential and self-reinforcing Totally. Cycle, because only when you believe in something to be real will you invest energy into it. Yep. And so only when you see there is this separation between you and what you perceive will you like think that these things have some inherent existence apart from the whole flow of yep. reality. Um, okay, and so to come back to like this um, initial question of microdosing and how it can help us to see this um, inherent unity of everything that is. How would you say is like, um, would you say there's a difference between, for example, let's say someone is going with um, a microdosing experience every week and he does that for like 50 times over the years or, um, or over a year. And compare that to someone who is going to decide to like do a three gram or even more trip when we say, uh, like, let's say you're with magic mushrooms. Um, in your, or do you think there's a difference between how those two paths will unfold? Yeah. Um, 
I would also start by suggesting that, and I know Frank talks about this quite a bit as well, but that um, entheogens are like one of the main um, tools on the belt, but then there are other tools on the belt. Like, for example, concentration and meditation, um, like Vipassana is a great tool. So is just the normal, like, do nothing meditation and like sort of um, go beyond the thinking mind. Um mm-hmm. Yep. Into what is the space that allows the arising and disappearing of the thinking mind. Um, and then see how that's the same um, for all of us. Like that space is the same. The I is the same um, before our name. Um, and so contemplation is really important, like self-inquiry. So self-inquiry, Vipassana, do nothing, concentration, meditation, um, in, in addition to entheogens. So that way it's like you're tackling awakening from the many sided mountain. Um, and all of those things are like compounding onto each other in the process. Um, and that's kind of what I did the last like five years. And that sort of helped me a lot. Um, then in terms of like, if you do end up doing entheogens more frequently, I mean, for me, um, it's been like every six months or something. Um, yeah, the last like five years. And um, and yeah, I would say that that's a pretty good um, like timeline uh, for people that at least have already um, went through great um insight into unity um, because it, you know, for people that have went through great insight into unity, it makes sense to sort of like do it a little bit um, at a longer period of rest between um, to sort of let your new um, insights sort of further integrate. Um, But if you're first, if you're like really, really fresh and you have no idea and you feel a lot of separation conditioning, um, yeah, it could be good for you to maybe do it once a month um, to start. Um, like a half gram or a gram every month to start. Now doing it every week is a little bit, um, you could do that. Um, I've, I know people that do that, but you sort of also want to ask yourself like, um, you know, the intention is to integrate what you learn. So that's the key thing is like, if you're going to feel interconnectedness, if you're going to feel oneness, if you're going to feel service to others, if you're going to start feeling that, Um, to take the week, to take the month instead of the week for you to actually maybe do something with honor in service to other people, um, in service to the whole, um, that that would potentially teach you another important lesson or two or three in the three week break normally than trying to compound it every week. So that's just some of my take on it. Yeah. What about you? Um, I agree with all that you just said um, because in my own journey it has also unfolded in this like slower process you could say or not really forced process where I gave myself the time to let my lived reality catch up to the insights that I had and it just feels so so much healthier. Um, In the beginning it was like more of a kind of let's see how how deep this can go and how many insights one can have but then you come back and it's like so much and you have to somehow put it all in its right place and you need just time to figure that out and um what you mentioned there with um the practices that's also much of the emphasis of what i do over on my channel um i mostly talk about these Uh, practices and how you can have these insights also with contemplation with meditation and here's really where i see them both like micro dosing like true micro dosing um up to half a gram of mushrooms let's say maybe even 0.1 0.2 where i see they really shine is in the combination with meditation and especially contemplation cool because compared to like a three gram trip where there is no choice anymore you just have to surrender the smaller trip in my experience you can also 
use their power beautifully to direct to certain questions or topics you want to contemplate and really um, where one person would take like 1.1 gram and go about their day as usual and get like really nothing spiritual out of it. If you approach it with the right mindset and go deep with it in meditation, that combination I found is super powerful. And it also, in my experience, is able or it's, it's possible to do that on a weekly basis because it just takes your meditation that little bit deeper and doesn't like give you material to work on for weeks. And um, yeah, cool. so it's all about the dosage. Um, but would you say at a certain point, if someone only does smaller doses, they hit a certain plateau or yeah. they cannot have deeper insights and that maybe yeah. higher dose would be necessary? Yeah, totally. Totally. It would be like for me to say, like, why don't you go hike um, a mountain? Um, but um, let's say the mountain is, uh, you know, whatever, 3000 meters. Um, but I tell you, uh, um, only go uh, 300 meters up the mountain, but then only go 300 meters up the mountain again next week. And then only go 300 meters up the mountain again next month. And one year from now, only go 500 meters up the mountain. So, you know, you kind of like feel into that um, in your own process. Um, and like, you're only going to see so far 300 meters up the mountain. Like you're mm -hmm. only going to see so far. Like when you look, um, when you look, you're only going to see so far. But when you go 500 meters up, when you go 1,000 meters up, when you start really going up, um, so when you start doing two, three, four grams of magic mushrooms, when you're really starting to, you know, get up almost to this heroic dose, um, you're seeing like the end of it. You know, you're seeing the the, the last bit on the mountain. Um, you're going the... Um, the 3000 meters up. But the thing about um, that is that it's like a gondola ride. The entheogen is like a gondola ride because you go um, and like a magic mushrooms is like a slower gondola ride than like 5-MeO-DMT is a faster gondola ride. So mm -hmm. you're, you're taking this gondola up and then you peak the top and then the gondola goes back down. And so what I'm suggesting with the analogy is that um, you want to wear this like heroic dose or these larger doses would take you after you sort of build up the courage with the micro doses and you start tasting more and more of the one that you already are and awakening to that, that what you would like to do is you would like to re-baseline your identity, your conviction, your realization all of it, you would like to re-baseline that in your moment-to-moment -moment direct experience as the top of the mountain without entheogens. And mm -hmm. that's where contemplation, meditation, self-inquiry, um, that's where all of these things come into play. Like, you know, when Frank talks about this, he talks about it like there's a contemplative um, fitness, th that AI that's just running all the time. Um and like, that's sort of what it ends up being like, is like, you just, you run as the entire universe, you run as infinity, um, and everything is just a lesson for the individuation, for its um, unique expression. It, everything is seen as just a school. Everything's seen mm -hmm. as just a lesson. Um, everything's seen as just one, not like separate people telling me um, things, but rather it's myself telling myself um, the thing that I need to know for me to decrease my separation conditioning and for me to feel more oneness. Um, and you see that same thing happening with like the decentralization of the banking and energy infrastructures around the planet is it's a shift in identity from separation conditioning, from centralization 
to planetary collective awakening decentralization. Um, so you, mm. you, so the mountain analogy is important here. If you're going to take these micro doses over periods of time, you're only going to go, you know, 300 meters up repeatedly, but then you do baby step your way up to gain more insight of what is seen from the mountain. Um, mm. and then the, the joke is that, you know, when you do get to the top, you were it the whole time. Um, that's the cosmic joke and it's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, on that level that you were speaking from, um, you also get the insight that when you take something or when you take a psychedelic again, that it didn't even happen, that it doesn't even, that it's not a thing. <laughs> you are not on a trip or not. It's all, it's one thing. And it's just there. Yeah. It's just, you could say, an opportunity for you to see what is already there. It's kind of, you allow yourself for that experience to unfold, but it's not in the substance. There is no psychedelic that is like doing that apart from the flow of experience, which the psychedelic is a part of. Yeah. And you're we, you, one of, one of the ways to visualize this is that you're, you're God with like a stylus, you know, you're the painter, you're infinity, you're the painter. Um, mm -hmm. you're using your will and your choice and you're choosing, you're willing the asleepening process. You're willing it. You're building your own, you're with your own stylus, but you're not doing it consciously. You're doing it unconsciously or subconsciously. You've designed your own escape room and people yeah. think that they're victims to reality, but they designed their own escape room. Infinity designed its own escape room for itself. And then the liberation, like Bentinho, Bentinho Massaro talks about this, like a unfreezing of will. Like you have all this will that's frozen in these like subconscious separation conditioning patterns. And what you're doing over time is you're regaining, you're unfreezing that will and it's becoming more and more liquid and more and more air-like. And you recognize yourself as this God painter, infinite stylus. And then that's it. Like that's it. Like you feel the, like the, the vibration of what it is. Um, and that's your state. That's, that's your new state of being without without anything else that needs to, I need to ingest something or and nothing, nothing like that. Right. You just are it moment to moment to moment. And yeah. 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 That's such a beautiful description. Um, in my own experience, it unfolded as the recognition that a psychedelic trip is no different than my regular state in the sense that it is, it is all my creation. It is all my wish And even the, like you could say, the confused state before knowing myself as the oneness is the same beauty. It's the same. And that, that gives so much peace, you know, yep. and it could also give to listeners here, I feel um, a sense of, yes, you are on that path, on that spiritual unfoldment that is happening through you, but it is at the same time perfectly where you are it is perfect to be in the place of not knowing of not perceiving what is it is a paradox in the end but it is still god's will to experience all parts of itself and to in order to do that it has to confuse itself totally. with a with a particular role with totally. like with the individual human absolutely it is, Yeah, that's just how realities are created. Yep. It's there is no even say you could even say it's the most important feature of realities is the ability to fall asleep and to wake up. Yeah. If it wasn't for that, what would we what would we be talking about? You know, Nothing. it's you'd be yeah. it'd be like it'd be like if you landed in Grand Theft Auto or video game and you were immediately level 100 with access to everything and yeah. you just started the game. It wouldn't yeah. make any sense. No. Yeah. yeah. And that's also why, um, why I feel microdosing is so great. And it was overemphasized, I think, in the 60s to take only the full release dose. I think it was also um, then revealed in the overall reaction of the society that this 
approach was maybe a bit too fast as it was maybe for the individuals that were I can only imagine but many of them back then without like proper knowledge in the western societies were challenged by these insights more than they maybe could handle and bringing that kind of unreflected experience into society was only there or could only happen in that backlash could only result in that backlash of um, making all of these substances illegal and um, so learning from that I think now is you could say I don't want to call that way but you could see it as like the second revolution of psychedelics I think we have learned from that to go slower like on an individual basis but also as a community to say okay for myself I feel more comfortable starting low and then I give myself the time to integrate really everything I, I experience and I see this as a five or ten year or maybe even 20 year journey and I don't need to rush and because <laughs> as we just said it is God's will to experience every perspective and so um, there's nothing wrong with wherever anybody is staying uh, is standing in their understanding of the whole of reality yep and it's all you so the faster that you remember that it's all you that yeah. the more that you don't have judgments about your other selves it doesn't make any sense um yeah. once you sort of wake up to that um it becomes your radiance of love and acceptance for the entire creation exactly as it is because there's still um like you can feel it still in the majority of the collective's um, energy is that um, I don't love and accept you because you think differently than I do. Like that's still like a very common way of being, um, especially like political parties. Um, and even it's seen in um, – so basically seeing through, I mean, I was going to say like it's seen in like sports as well, like sports teams clashing, like it's seen in all this type of stuff. Um, but seeing through the separation is the key to awakening, but not um, seeing through it and then stopping intellectually because that's a different, um, it's like basically being the mycelium. Like that's another way to say it is like you are the mycelium, like you are the field, like underground there's mycelial networks mm -hmm. and you are them. Like you are the way that they in a decentralized way talk to each other and exchange resources with plants. Like you are that. Um, uh, and you, be, you are that you like you, you re, you wake up to being that and not to um to being a separate person with a non-love and a non-acceptance for the rest of people that think differently than you do so you recognize that you are the all so just waking up to that is like i mean it's un it's yeah it's incomprehensible because you also wonder well I never fell asleep. Also, it's it's like one of the most interesting parts of yeah remembering is like I didn't fall asleep. Um, so all of this plays really deeply into this process of like what do you want to do with your intention of microdosing and the intention of microdosing. I don't know um, people's exact personal journeys and what their intentions are in the in the process, but generally speaking, whether you consciously say it or not, it's to dissolve separation conditioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to say, like, the way you described it right now, this analogy to the mycelium, it clicked for me right now for the first time. Like, cool. I heard it before, but now I, I see how you mean it, I think. And let me, like, Maybe you rephrase Please. it so you, you can uh, yeah. uh, uh, reflect on that. It's, so before realizing the oneness of reality, it feels like there is a, a conscious perceiver that's going on here and a conscious perceiver going on over there. So here is 
called Lauritz, over there it's called Atlas, and all the other people in our lives. But then when you realize it is more about the exchange than about the perception, because there is no separate perceiver from what is already like experienced, then it's kind of like what you said, the mycelium. The mycelium is more about the sharing of nutrients in our case of experiences of concepts of understanding of feelings emotions Perfect. so it's more about what is going on on the level of sharing this experience than it is about me perceiving something you perceiving something yes yes it's very well okay. said like in in math um one of the most important um, ways of visualizing this as well, it's been talked about for a while, is that everything's about the relationships. Mm -hmm. So when you look at something like this network theory with all these with all these nodes and with all of the little lines between the nodes, that um, the data that is exchanged in consciousness with itself, is why we do this. Yes. The information and the energy that is exchanged but within um, ourselves and between ourselves is, um, is the way that this comprehends itself. It's the way that it dances with itself. Um, so another way of saying like what you were indicating is that being the mycelium means that you are everybody and everything that's happening between everybody. Um, mm -hmm. and you are another way of thinking about it is like dissolving all of the barriers completely between all of the different people, as well as all of the different, um, animals and all of the different you know, creatures, all of that. And being the entire planet, being the entire soul, being the entire galaxy, the whole universe, being that, being that, mm -hmm. like being like the, so the earth and the solar system that is here and the earth and the solar system on the other side, it's you, it's still you over there undergoing a dance. It's still you over there going a dance. Yeah. And, and then you also see that it's like an entire comprehensive, like the mycelium extend itself beyond the earth to the whole universe. Mm -hmm. And that's all doing the comprehension. That's all doing the information um, and energy exchange, doing work, um, reality as information and energy doing work. Um, mm -hmm. And so to, to, to get this shift, you have to, again, it's about this decreasing. If you're not decreasing your separation conditioning, if your direct experience from microdosing is and in your integration afterward, if it's not um, like you feeling less separation conditioning, less, um, like sadness and anger and unhappiness and suffering, um, then something's happening in the mix where your, your intention isn't set for the awakening. Um, but when your intention is set for awakening, then you'll notice in your direct experience, less suffering, more happiness, less separation, more oneness, more peace, seeing that everywhere being that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the core for me. Yeah, that reminded me of um, something that I learned from Rupert Spira. Um, yeah. I love him. It's, um, I think, one of the most clear teachings or teachers um, out there. And his emphasis is always on if you want an answer and you look for some conceptualization of how to explain what is experienced, to go back to experience because all that is can be ever known is here in experience available and when you just mentioned that you see the whole universe everything as one it must be recognized here not in concept not in rational understanding it's you see that here right now and one example of how this unfolds is my very direct experience, if I speak from that right now, there is no difference between me listening to you speaking and me listening to Lauritz speaking. 
It is all one unfolding. You could say it's unfolding in consciousness, but that would be already too much. There is no consciousness separate from this one unfolding. And in there, as you just emphasized, is a sense of growing freedom, or from that comes a sense of growing freedom. Because it is only the sense of being a restricted self that is then creating the feeling of limitation through having an illusory difference between it and something else. Perfect. But when you, and for me, and also what Rupert Spira says, this can really be seen all in direct experience. And it is important to say what you, or emphasize what you also just said, is if your intention is right, that you want to recognize this, then your experience will give you the yeah. give you all that is necessary in order to yeah. recognize it. Yes, yes. Because you are the stylist, you are the painter, you are God, you are the creator. And so you with your will, with your choice, you determine your reality. And yeah. so if at the top of your uh, desire list is awakening, then you will um, manifest more and more of the um, direct experience of you awakening. Um, if your top of your desire list is trying to decrease your separation conditioning through substances and through relationships, through material possessions, um, you will you'll run into a wall repeatedly, um, and you'll wonder why is this? Why am I experiencing like a oh well while I was you know orgasming or having sex or whatever that um, oh like. I, I felt, you know, my sense of self was, wasn't there. The people don't know those, those words. And so they just call it like um, sex or orgasm or love or whatever, even though it's a really perverted um, form of, of when they use the word love. But that, that's basically what they're going for. And so um, they're going for the, the slipping away of the self, um, but they don't know that that's the case. And so the most simple way to slip away of the self is to recognize that I'm God, I am the stylist, I am the painter, and I may as well put awakening at the top of my um, of my um, desire list for um, for being. And then in that process, what will manifest for me is, for example, it will manifest um, content like this. It will manifest um, a connection to a microdosing. Um, um, connection, um, or a, um, it'll, you know, you'll stumble across Ramana Maharshi and you'll start inquiring into who am I? You'll, you'll, um, you'll maybe run into, um, um, one of the, um, like Bentinho's meditation mastery retreat, um, and you'll learn concentration and meditation and realization and integration. So there's, um, if you if you put it at the top of your desire list, it'll happen. Um, mm -hmm. If you have it in like rank number ten in your desires is truth and awakening, um, then you see where that's going to go. So, yeah. yeah. How do you um, combine the view from the human where free will seems to be limited? where you cannot decide what is happening in society at large, where you are subject to certain things in your environment that seemingly are not under your control with the realization that you are the one and that you are creating everything out of your own love for existence. How did you like... How, how, how do these two viewpoints go together and give me the two viewpoints again so from our perspective from the human perspective it seems what we can decide with our free will is very limited and on the other hand when you have the realization of oneness it is clear that still everything is coming from you but not from the human so where is like the mm. where is the all encompassing free will where is that? Is that originated somewhere or? 
How well, would you describe it? Let's see if I understood the, the question. Um, yeah, so for me, the way that I see it is that um, intelligent infinity creates first awareness. It creates will. It creates choice. Um, it creates the ability to perceive, the ability to know its creation. And then it creates love and light. And so everything's composed of awareness, love, and light. Um, and you can think about it like the electromagnetic dance that everything is subatomically is that love and light and awareness dancing with itself, playing with itself. Um, so again, information and energy, you can't go any, you can't take reality down any further than information and energy. You just can't. And so that's what awareness, love, light is. Um, now, in terms of the human, the human starts with how I see it. It starts with frozen will. It starts with subconscious, unconscious patterns, habits that are more primal, that are more animalistic. Um, now, this doesn't mean that there's not you're not going to find the um, you're not going to find the occasional sage from uh, you know ten thousand or even a hundred thousand years ago. You might you might find an occasional sage back then, um, but. Um, so generally we're we in a pattern of becoming self-aware and then um so intelligent infinity becomes self-aware through this veil is fail and then um in that process it unfreezes more and more of its will and choice from its conditioning and its patterns around separation um and ego and personal bubbles um and it shifts more and more towards um, having like air-like will. So it like it feels more and more of its stylus. Like basically right now, only by being like silent and still can I like really feel the stylus, like really clearly. And that's also mm -hmm. what is meant by, you know, nirvana, the complete cessation of all movement, that you feel that, that you, that you are that, that you are that absolute permanent changeless reality that is what gives rise to endless change, to infinite creation. But so when you're still, when you're totally still, like right now we're using words and we're exchanging words, but when you're super still, when you're super silent, You can feel the air-like stylus. You can feel that you have this will and choice to whatever you want next, whatever you want next, whatever you desire next. Um, but if you're reactive and if you're um, moving at a pace of intaking a stimuli and subconsciously or unconsciously getting triggered and then moving in that behavior pattern, um, more of your will is, is frozen. You're not conscious. You're not awake to the stylus, the air-like stylus. So that's one way to, to put that. Um, but again, it's really important that the absolute and the human become transcended. Like the, the distinction between the two becomes transcended. Um, so even a, 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 a creature that or you know a human that is still very frozen free will um is the same as um the sage that is um j solely meditating on god all day um okay so yeah. would you say that um you could express this also as a cutting away of the of the drive you you could say in our, from our perspective, it seems like they're coming from the past. So our conditionings that are yeah. usually in our, like, for the regular, like, let's say, normie, they are driving our behavior. And in that sense, or to the degree that we have these fixed concepts of how reality is going to behave, in yeah. that sense, or to that degree, we are unfree. Yes. And on the flip side, to the degree that we can remain present in the presence of what is, there is less and less conditioning. Yeah. And in that falling away of conditioning, 
arises the freedom for it to unfold in an infinite or as an infinite possibility. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's what it would feel like. Yep. Um, but then at the same time, it is in the presence that it seems to be free. No, in the presence it is free. And from the perspective of putting that presence into time, closing it between yeah. past and future, yeah. that it seems unfree. Yeah. So for me, in, in my perception, it's mainly the concept of time. That yeah. Is, yeah. Liberate yourself from that. And, and you'll, yeah. and you'll um, be like, that's probably one of the biggest um, conditionings is time. Yeah. 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 Destroy that um, with love light. And, um, and you're so much freer time. Time is um, one of the biggest ones along with separation. Yeah. Time is one of the biggest ones. Yeah. Did you do any per specific, um, meditations contemplations in order to dissolve this felt sense of solidity in the concept of time or the concept of time well well yeah so i would say that for for the vast majority of awakening um like if you would to pair micro dosing um i would pair it with self-inquiry um you can also pair it with um just classic concentration and meditation um but I actually think that self-inquiry can basically take you all the way. I don't even necessarily think that you need a microdosing. I think self-inquiry can basically take you all the way to awakening. Um, so for example, with time, so basically you can use the intellect to go beyond the intellect in a sense. You can use um, like rationality and logic um, to kind of grok um, your nature, your true nature. You can grok infinity. Um, so like one of the most simple ways to do that would be to like recognize yourself. Like this is like you can just jump straight there. You don't necessarily need to like like investigate time like from like kindergarten to fifth grade to ninth grade to college. Like like you can go straight there by just by just doing a um, – like, you know, you see yourself as um, like the Grand Theft Auto character. And instead of identifying with the Grand Theft Auto character, you should be the Xbox or the PlayStation that is playing infinite games. Yes. Um, and so then you see, oh, shit, well, I'm not just a character. My identity is actually the very fabric of existence of eternity or infinity itself. Like that's my identity. And then you sort of liberate yourself from the time trap faster. But like if you do want to take it a little more gradually for people that are that are listening, um, um, I've made a good amount of content on this. But like one of the most simple ways is to just recognize how much of an illusion all of the symbols are on a clock. Like the symbols on the clock itself are just a bunch of squiggly lines that are representative of how we measure the earth spinning. That's it. The earth yes. rotating on its axis is one earth day. And then we label that with little squiggly lines. And another one is that you take like the earth that orbits the sun every 365.25 days and you're like, well, that's some fucking arbitrary ass number. Like one year is 365.25 days. It's just arbitrary numbering um, to represent something useful for us um, so that we can, you know, more easily, you know, you and I can meet up for this show at a specific time. And it, and it works in that sense. But so if you sort of like for generality to like liberate yourself more and more from what was like another one is, you know, biological impermanence is another one like, Oh shit. Like I'm this impermanent biological creature. And because of that, I'm locked into believing that I'm the body. And, mm -hmm. and um, you have to like the netty netty method or the not this, not that method of declining the body and declining the thinking mind so that you can then recognize yourself capital S, God, 
infinity. And then you can include the body and the thinking mind. You can include it after. You can see God as the body and you can see God as the thoughts, totally. And you can radically love and accept them as they are. But you can't start at impermanence. You have to start at seeking permanence, seeking what is infinite, seeking what your truest nature is. And then recognizing that, ah, that pure potentiality, which is my truest nature, is actualizing itself as these seemingly different fireworks in a dance with itself. And then I will eternally be doing this. And then yeah. that's where you liberate yourself from the impermanence, and then you can include the impermanence. Yeah. That's so great. That just got me thinking about how this unfolded very practically in um, my meditation sessions. And maybe if I describe this, this may help someone. So um, let me just uh, say how, how I very directly worked on dissolving this sense of being something happening in time. Um, nice. We, we all know when we meditate and we start, we um, usually most people start on with concentrating on the breath. And then you sit there and you think, okay, I'm breathing, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out, and you let that be your anchor. But then it, when you are aware of your breath, you can also become aware that that is not the only thing that you are aware of right now you are also aware of your concept of breathing and that is happening or that is creating your sense of time. If we like, let's say only look at the breath and we can really crowd out all other, other thoughts, then in that moment of really being only with the breath, our idea of that we are breathing is creating time and you can See that for yourself when you are separating the two and you are only aware of what is happening really right now. That is maybe a sensation that you would, would call breathing in. But in that moment, you thinking that it is part of a breath that is then followed by something breathing out and it was previously you were breathing in, that is how in this very moment you create and in every moment you create a sense of time. And when you can sort these two out, like your concepts about what is happening right now from the flow of experience, then you are, you are stepping outside of time and you will see that you cannot create time outside of this presence. Because every time you do that, it arises as a thought. It arises as a concept, as a context for what you are experiencing. Nice. Yeah. And for me, I just had to look at this over and over and over again yeah. to like finally see very clearly that, oh, they, these are actually two different things. Because when you just start meditating, it seems like one thing. It seems like your breath is what it is, but there is actually the experience and the concept that are so entangled that it's not easy to yeah. to see at first yeah and you can extend that even further to not only time but just go even take it all the way um yeah. again much of this show is um about taking it all the way um as efficiently as possible um and just take your name all the way Like your name is just a concept. Um, so funny that you say that. Yeah, I, I just did this today um, because in the past I often like repeated my name over and over again. And back then it felt strange because there was something, as, there was somehow a story connected to my name. Yep. And it felt weird to repeat my name over and over again because then it was somehow no longer... There was, there was no longer this story with the name if you repeat it often, but today when I did that, there was no more story, no more. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't arise anymore. I don't know how to describe it, but yeah. Yeah, and so you take the, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven symbols that are strung together for your name and the five symbols strung together for my name and you just deconstruct it. And then you're like, oh shit, it's just a bunch of squiggly lines strung together as symbols that then we use these vocal vibrations to get this this individuation's attention. Um, Mm -hmm. And then you recognize that your entire life, like we talked about, has been self-referential. It's been self-reinforcing, self-simulating, and that you liberate yourself from that that construction project that you've been doing your whole life of separation conditioning and this little five symbol, seven symbol strung together name. Um, And then you dissolve into being the one. And you, which you've been the whole time, but you've, yeah. And so then the, the other side to this is that if you put a name, like we call the universe, the universe, you know, we put a name to the whole thing, right? We put a name to it. Um, Mm -hmm. And like, if you called um, this, if you called this universe, um, like, uh, let's say 78 and then you call um, you just you gave it a name you gave this a name that you can then deconstruct again you can deconstruct 78 you can also deconstruct the universe the word itself with the strung together symbols um, and all that's left is just the very fact that we are just that mm-hmm. I am just that this is um, is just what's left and it's not as um yeah and that and that's the thing is like we can use all these symbols and we can talk we can do this symbol exchange with vibration and whatnot and it's it's good and i've been doing it 784 um of these um shows and um you know i guess one thing that i'm really you know feeling like more and more after like four plus years of, of doing this um, is that like, it's just so truth is beyond the vocal vibrations and it's um, so that's why like, you know, I've been messaged a lot the last couple of months about, you know, like, well, what's up with content and stuff like that. And um, well, it just feels like I am truth more than I've ever been before. And so now it's sort of about like honing in on it so much, so clearly, so precisely that basically everything that I, you know, speak or do or am or be um, moving forward will just be even more precisely it. Um, And so that's, you know, that's one of the things to consider as you microdose, like don't, run off right away and tell everybody about your experience because you're going to get a lot of people that tell you that you deserve to be in a mental hospital or that you, um, um, and, or, or like your parents will put you on pharmaceuticals or something. You know, there's, there's a bunch of fucked up things that, um, still happen in the modern day. Like if you, if you have an experience of the isness and then you go, everything is one and you start, you know, telling everybody that you're going to get, slapped um and so it's 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 something to remember along the journey is to basically take your realizations um and find the right people to talk to them about and it's going to be hard because it's still not that much of the planet is super open to talking about microdosing and awakening on a on a consistent basis but Finding that community where you can openly share about your microdosing experience or about your realizations or about when you're reading the law of one and you're studying intelligent infinity or whatever, um, that you have people that you can talk to it about that can then reflect you where you may still have some separation conditioning because they've already went through those patterns before. So you can accelerate the depletion of your separation conditioning from 100 or from 90 or wherever you're at to, to 20 or below just by finding a really good, as in Buddhism, the triple gem, you have Sangha. You need the community. You need this aspect too it as well. You, it's not just the Buddha. It's not just the awakened one. It's not just the teachings, the Dharma, the path, but it's also the Sangha. It's the community. It's this lineage. It's the all of the people, all of the 
entheogens, all of the direct path teachings, all of the um, shift from um, a sleepening to awakening and the rapid um, rapidization of that process, um, it's your best friend. And so find the other people, find the others. There are no others. It's hilarious. But find them, the ones that um, do uh, know this and uh, surround yourself with them as fast as possible along the way. Yeah. yeah, that mirrors my experience. I also, in the beginning, was more eager to talk about my experiences and insights to people. And over the last years, I have refrained from doing that because it is not communica communicatable to people who have no experience of it at all, who have no idea of what you are doing there. Um, if they are open and if people approach me that and say, hey, I, uh, I feel like there's you have something there and I'm interested in that, then I, I try to find out where they are at and how can I how I can speak to them and what can fall on gr uh, fruitful ground. Um, but yeah, in general, as you said, it's not possible to communicate it. And so the Sangha where you are with other people who just are there, you can just be in silence. And it's the most beautiful communication. Because if you are truly at the level with someone, yes, then yes, then you say one word and it's enough, or you don't even say anything. Exactly, yeah. because you're vibrating at the frequency of God. In most like simple terms, you're vibrating at the frequency of God, or you're vibrating at the frequency of the One, or you're vibrating at the frequency of love, light, awareness of the isness that it all is. Um, without separation conditioning. You're vibrating without separation conditioning. Um, and so, mm -hmm. so, so take um, your time in Sangha or take your time in silence like we talked about where you just pause and you're just still and you feel yourself as the stylist, as the painter, as that paintbrush with unlimited will. And potential to express yourself however you see fit and take that and just recognize it more and more every single day more and more you're with somebody ah take a moment and just recognize in that moment that you're the one talking to itself with this other person yeah. and just yeah more and more every day every day you know, Bentinho talks about it as two to five seconds every yeah. single day, more and more. You know, in Dzogchen, one of the most common teachings is just recognize empty cognizance over and over again, over and over. Recognize empty cognizance, empty cognizance. Yeah. This is empty cognizance talking to itself. Yeah. The one talking to itself. At a certain point, I feel it becomes more like an instrumental song whereas before you try to intellectualize and extract something from the teaching nice the more you listen to it it becomes more like the end in itself like a song that has no words nice nice and that's what it feels like and when you at a certain point read books or hear teachers or be with them it's, it's more what is not said in the words, it's more what, how the words are said or that they are there at all, you could also say. And in, in a similar way, I, I just this weekend was uh, on a trip to Berlin um, for a 30th birthday of a friend of mine. And, you know, these parties where you are involved in a lot of small talk, you... And you approach all of these people, not from the mind, but from the heart. Yeah. And you allow them to just be as an expression of consciousness. Then you connect to them much deeper. And I have found fascinating people that kind of were able to pick that up 
not many. Most of them were still a lot of them were consumed in their stories. But I had a few, and those were all women who were like a, more attuned to this heart centered openness of consciousness. And they, they quickly like connected to that. I could feel it. And it goes, you communicate then just on a different level. It's not about the words so much anymore. And you are connected in consciousness, in the heart. And it is beautiful to experience this flow of communication through the heart and not through the mind. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and Ramana and many other mystics have talked about just as soon as, um, as soon as you really have this anchored, um, there will come a time when you just forget everything that you've ever learned. And that's some fucking insane shit. It's basically like, um, yeah, it's basically like, you know, Bentinho had an exercise that he gave um, the No Limits um, community where he basically said, um, you know, destroy all of your memory, um, period. Mm -hmm. Like let go of all of your memories of mm -hmm. that you've ever had, ever. Like, and that's like the most fundamental, like emptying exercise you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're that empty, everything's just hyper fast refresh rate because nothing is triggering your conditioning. Nothing's triggering any memories. Um, nothing's triggering any ways that you've previously perceived reality. Everything mm -hmm. is always fresh and new and infant-like. Totally. How would you do that? Well, here's silence. I'm saying like silence and stillness is how to do it because like, like, like a really simple one is somebody will be like Republican. And then all of a sudden you'll have this fucking big word cloud pop mm -hmm. up about Republicans and all your thoughts about them or like Democrat, Poof, the big word cloud pops up or Africa, Poof, all the mm -hmm. China, Poof, the word cloud pops up, mom, Poof, word cloud pops up, money, Poof, word cloud pops up with all of your thoughts about that. Um, and instead, watch how magical it is when somebody says money. And it's just five symbols strung together into a vibration, and you just have no reference point to what that is. And it's just so you let go of it the moment it stops the word. Yeah, it basically dissolves into emptiness, is one of the ways to, to say it. Yeah. Yes. How would one do that with uh, visual objects? Because, for example, I tried to like tune into what you just said with the with the guitar that's standing there behind the camera and I see the guitar and it's not just the shape and the color. I know it's just that in the experience, but when I see this guitar, there are also kind of as a context subconsciously vibrating all my memories of it. And it's the same for when other people that you have some shared experience and past history with, when they appear in your life, you, I feel at least you cannot see them as just a fresh new experience. And there is this past and your memory always kind of vibrating in that experience. How would one do that in this case? Yeah, yeah. So you're not um, making it non-recallable. Mm -hmm. So it's still recallable. Yeah but you're completely free. So when the guitar appears, mm -hmm. you don't have the triggers come up of all these memories playing guitar, the things that I still want to do with the guitar, blah, blah, blah. Instead, what happens is the guitar appears, it disappears. And then what you do from a fresh place is then you with your stylus, you create whatever reality you want with that guitar. If you mm -hmm. want to go and pick it up and play, you will. If you don't want to, you won't. If mm -hmm. you want to if you want to play the piano, you will. It's just it just becomes um like when somebody says the word mom, like instead of have or dad, instead of having the word cloud about mom or dad come up, which is um, I like these things about my parents. I don't like these things about my parents. Um, um, 
blah, 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 the whole stories, the whole narratives. Instead, what you do is you just see the concept appear and disappear and just dissolve. And then from a free place, rather than a triggered place, from a free place, then you can, as whatever you wish, like, ah, yeah, moms, yeah, cool, yeah, dads, cool, you know, whatever, Mm -hmm. from a free, spontaneous place that doesn't have any conditioning um, enraveled within it. And this is another thing that microdosing will show you. And I know we wanted to talk about um, a little bit about LSD and 5-MeO-DMT as well and the differences and whatnot, but... We kind of actually talked about that a little bit when we were doing the mountain analogy, because in essence, generally, magic mushrooms and LSD will take you on the gondola ride, depending on the dosage. Again, this 3000 meter mountain that so on lower dosages, they'll take you less up the mountain on higher dosages they'll take you all the way but they'll take you all the way on the gondola ride and then back down over a longer period of time whereas 5-MeO DMT is like the much faster gondola ride super fast and mm-hmm. it also like we're talking like the difference is maybe 30 minutes 5-MeO DMT versus 6 to 8 hours magic mushrooms or LSD and so we're also talking about the rapid the rapid the rapidness of the dissolution of the ego structure. So that's what we mean by that mountaintop. And so, and again, we talked about integration as well being so critical here. Like you have to integrate what you're seeing at the top of the mountain in your day-to-day experience. Um, Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, the intention of awakening is not present. The whole intention of awakening is to integrate oneness into direct daily experience Mm -hmm. it doesn't get more simple than that yeah yes um the experience itself i have felt is can still be very different in content um the earlier very deep mushroom experiences of mine they have been very chaotic there was no sense no reference point no sense of any recognition of what was happening there was no for example um maybe this can give like a feeling of how insane such an experience can be is i was standing in my room and i felt in my throat this sense of thirst there was just this sensation and and I was aware of it, but there was no ability to conceptualize this sensation at all. So while I was seeing my bottle of water there in the room, I wasn't able to make any connection at all between Mm -hmm. I have to drink water for this feeling to go away. Like even the idea of water wasn't there I, w- I was standing in my room and i was pouring the bottle on the ground you know something you wouldn't do because such an experience on mushrooms especially they can show you a lot of individual um conditioning fears you have the fear of going insane right you you are conditioned to believe that sanity is something good and insanity is something bad and you fear insanity a lot and you that's what's keeping you thinking in the ways that you do and so different compounds can face can put you face to face with different conditionings and fears yeah At least that's my experience yeah, yeah. And, and based on the strains based on the dosages um, they will unravel conditionings Absolutely. And they will be different flavors. We also talked about that a little bit, um, but they're going to be different flavors. Um, Again, the reason why I highly recommended Magic Mushrooms is because it's the most, in my opinion, just the most um, decentralizing or universalizing in the most kind of like soft, gentle, loving way, um, in my opinion. Um, And... um, have you tried 2CB? 
Uh, I haven't yet. No, two CB. Okay. Um, I haven't had like a major trip on it, but the micro dosing experiences they were um, uh, incredibly promising. I would say um, I, the the vibe they had, I feel, is very loving. It's they say also it's a combination of um, MDMA and LSD in mm. its effect. And so I feel I want to research that chemical more just to feel more comfortable recommending it to people um, because it doesn't have the downsides of MDMA. It has no tolerance. Uh, you build up no tolerance to it and it, it leaves the part to reason about your experience intact. So, Oh, interesting. Yeah, you don't get that mindfuck component that you can get on mushrooms oh you where, totally get mind fucked totally yeah you can't really reason while it's going on at the higher dosages you're surrendered yeah. like you said it's surrendered yeah yeah in that sense 2cb is more more um i think it's a better entrance psychedelic for people who have very deep fears about losing their minds, about going insane, because it somehow leaves that ability to reason about what you experience right now intact. And that is, I, I find very fascinating. So I want to look into it uh, a lot more in the future. Yeah, while you were, while you were sharing, I just started kind of like researching it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it comes in this, uh, I also have like in this powder form and you um, you can just also ingest it like LSD. You can snort it or even pluck it, but um, it's it's a very, very gentle experience. And because it's in this MDMA-like, it has this, um, what's that, what's the English name, this... Um, empathogenic quality to it i feel it's very uh, very friendly experience and you can surrender much easier to the insights you have because it feels so loving cool cool yeah it's I really think, interesting um, um i think it's worldwide it's still um or not maybe not worldwide but yeah there are it's not legal in most countries but it's a very interesting uh, substance. Cool, bro. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you are probably also aware of this uh, channel, uh, actualize.org. For sure, and, Leo. Yeah, yeah, Leo, he is. Uh, he had a trip report maybe three years ago or something like that. And it is a very, very, um, yeah, very interesting trip for sure. And um Anyone who is watching, I can recommend uh, if there is interest in that uh, substance to check that uh, trip report out. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I'm feeling. Um, I'm feeling. Do we like, have anything? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm feeling like intention is like feeling like it's good, like in terms of like coming to a close. Do you feel like there are other things that you wanna um, discuss? Hmm. No, I think we have pretty much covered a lot of ground. I mean, it is definitely not all. Um, we didn't say everything about psychedelics. It's the most complex topic there is probably out there. So and how um, it unravels the ego separation conditioning and how it then oh, create catalyzes awakening. Like that's a very um, we did a good job covering that as the essence of, of yeah. the talk, which, yeah. which, which is the point. Like there's no other point to do entheogens except to unravel your separation conditioning so that you can awaken. Like in terms of truth, truth, like pursuing truth, like otherwise you're just pursuing an experience which is still trying to dissolve separation conditioning and feel truth. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's trying that, but you have to combine it with your intention to make it work yep. really well. And that is also why many people can take things like uh, 
LSD or 2CB in a party setting and don't get any spiritual insights out of it. The intention is just not there. And so whenever you go into a trip, know that how you approach it from a mental set point is very important. Um, And also, yeah, all the um, safety concerns uh, are don't just go blindly into like a high dose. I think what we recommended here in this uh, talk is very important to start low. It's always better recommendation than, than to say start with a heroic dose. Um, I think that's uh, irresponsible. So, yeah. I'm also going to put in the bio um, the Healing Hustlers. Um, so it's two of my um, closest friends. They're um, producing some of the absolute best um magic mushrooms in the the United States. And um, I'll put the link in the bio below and people can um, buy directly from them. Um, So for people that want, um, and I know they ship all across the US and I think they're, um, they can ship potentially across um, maybe um, internationally. So Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'll put the link in the bio below for you guys. If you do want to try a micro dose, like a half gram or a full gram, or if you've already, um, if you want to go 3000 meters up your little heroic dose. Um, so, but remember to combine it with the self inquiry and with meditation, contemplation with other things that we were talking about here. Um, and, and yeah, make sure you're doing this intelligently with, um, with well, um, educated um people with well-educated people with um um also with with the smart environments like your ambiance is intentionality like we've been talking about so many times your intention being for awakening that in itself will create such a good experience for you um mm-hmm. such a good insight and realization for you um so yeah yeah uh one thing i would like to mention is um if you go with psychedelics as you mentioned before you don't have to do them you could reach these insights maybe it takes longer but you can reach them through self-inquiry meditation alone but if you choose to go with psychedelics be aware that there is the possibility of having so many great insights that you are neglecting your dualistic life because we all have to like work earn money that's still all not going away when you have deep mystical experiences and so having an experience a mystical experience from the place of having your life in order feels much better than starting from chaos chaos so um i would advise people if they don't go the slow and steady meditation routine for which you need to have uh, um, your life in order in order for that to work long term um, then be careful not to like overdo it too quickly and neglect because it tends to cause people to neglect their um, other responsibilities in life and at the end there is only this it is to be enjoyed and so live your best life whether you take psychedelics or not beautiful brother yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that was a great conversation. Me too, bro. And also, everyone can check out um, Laritz's YouTube channel. Um, It's Conscious Development. The link is in the bio below also. Um, So check it out. Go and watch his content. Um, He's uploading quite frequently, and he's got a lot of great content on there. And go and support him. Subscribe, um, like his content, share his channel. with other people and also same thing goes for um our video as well like uh like the video um helps the algorithm like it subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet comment below with your thoughts on the video we'd love to hear from you and share the video with other people that you feel like this would positively benefit especially around microdosing and awakening and what that process is like and what it is actually all about and um, thanks, brother. What a great yeah! Uh, thank you a lot for having me. Like for for this opportunity, really enjoyed it. Me too, so, bro. Yeah, great. Okay, nice. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We love you very much. You and I will stick in the studio. I'll just end the stream. Okay. Yes. Bye, everyone. Goodbye.
See you. Great.